Uh, Casey Latini Butcher is an award-winning public historian whose work is dedicated to building empathy and advancing social justice. She's currently the director of the UW-Madison Public History Project, a multi-year effort to uncover and give voice to the histories of discrimination, exclusion, and resistance on campus. The project's physical exhibition, Sifting and Reckoning, is on display at the Chazen Museum of Art through December 23rd, and if you haven't seen it yet, I, you must go. It is absolutely phenomenal. You will not regret the time you spend going down there. Prior to coming to the UW, Casey was the co-curator of the award-winning exhibit, Owning Up, Racism and Housing in Minneapolis, which documented the history of racial housing discrimination and its lasting effects on that city. Casey is active in the public history community and is the co-chair of the membership committee for the National Council on Public History. Please join me in welcoming Casey Lucini Butcher. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. I know the weather is not ideal, so I appreciate you all coming out and braving the surprise snow. Um, so as Jen said, my name is Casey Lucini Butcher and I currently serve as the director of UW-Madison's Public History Project. I just have to talk it up a little bit since it is my job and it is very, very unique. Um, we've been working for the past few years to uncover and give voice to histories of discrimination and also resistance on campus. So our premiere exhibition, Sifting and Reckoning, is on display right now at the Chazen through December 23rd. It is free and open to the public. The exhibition is also accompanied by a rich companion website, reckoning.wist.edu, that allows online visitors to delve deeper into the histories of our campus. Further, our project also has an extensive event and lecture series alongside a suite of curricular materials that allow for even further engagement. So I would encourage you all to visit our website or the exhibit itself. I'm honored and excited to be here tonight to speak about the history of housing discrimination. As Jen mentioned, prior to my role as the Public History Project Director, I had the honor of co-curating an exhibit called Owning Up Racism and Housing in Minneapolis. The exhibit chronicled the history of housing discrimination in the city and its lasting effects. Through the curation and the research process, through discussions with elected officials and policymakers, through conversations with community members and elders, one thing became clear. The history of housing discrimination is not really a history at all. Housing discrimination continues to permeate our cities, shaping who has access to education, healthcare, jobs, parks and green spaces, and so much more. Yet our current problems are inextricably linked to our past. So it's worth exploring and it's worth considering deeply and ultimately I believe this history is worth reckoning with. So I'll begin with a story because that's what public historians like to do. Carson Gully's connection to the Madison community began on a fateful day in the summer of 1926. Donald L. Halverson, who is the director of dormitories at the University of Wisconsin, was passing through Tomahawk when a particularly brutal thunderstorm hit. He stopped at a roadside diner to find a kitchen, but it was already closed. So he asked if somebody could rustle him up a sandwich. Instead, Carson Gully prepared him a full meal. Carson was born in 1897 in Zama, a rural county in southwest Arkansas. His parents were sharecroppers who valued education and encouraged their son to succeed in whatever he chose to do. Carson tried his hand at teaching and at farming, but he found his true passion in cooking. This serendipitous meal impressed Halverson. He had learned his lifelong appreciation of fine cooking from his culinarily trained mother. So he invited Carson to visit with him after the meal. This visit turned into an invitation for an early morning fishing trip. The next day they had lunch. They also had another dinner. And finally, Halverson asked Carson if he would be interested in working at the university. And in December of 1926, Carson began his career at UW-Madison. It would be easy to highlight all of the accolades of Carson's career. He was an accomplished chef who created many best-selling cookbooks. He and his wife Beatrice, no relation to the Beatrice you'll meet in the play, were the first African-American couple to host their own TV show in the state of Wisconsin. He was the first African-American man to have a building named after him on UW-Madison's campus. To put it simply, he was a trailblazer. 
but there is a tension that undergirds all of our celebrations of Carson Gully, one that it would be remiss not to highlight. During most of his success, Carson Gully and his wife struggled to find housing. I wanna let that point sink in for a moment. A celebrated and accomplished chef, a television personality in homes across the state of Wisconsin, we know he spent a lot of his time fighting to find a place for him and his wife to live. These struggles didn't begin years after he came to Madison. They started immediately. In an oral history interview recorded in 1983 with Donald Hollerson, he recalled that one of Parsons' landlords had said, quote, I'm running for alderman and I can't get anywhere when I have a colored person living in my house. Carson, discouraged and fed up, almost left the city before his tenure had even begun. To retain him, Halverson had a small apartment built for the gullies in a basement of Trip Hall Dormitory. The university often celebrates this point, Halverson's act of solidarity. And it was, and I don't want to diminish that, but it always struck me as an incomplete story, probably because Carson Gully's voice is missing. What did he think of that arrangement? I can imagine it must have been hard to live where you work, to not get physical space from your workplace, to not get the grace of anonymity outside of a campus that is largely your office. I can imagine that it must have been difficult to not have total control over your space, to not be able to paint or redesign, because at the end of the day, they didn't own the space. And I can imagine that for Carson and Beatrice, it was never quite their home, their place under their ownership. Years later, when Carson gave an impassioned plea to the Madison City Council to pass a fair housing ordinance, he stated, quote, we gave up all the hope of ever owning a home in our own city. Carson retired early from UW in 1954 after 27 years as a chef, but never as a supervisor or a manager. Just prior to his retirement, there had been large scale staffing changes in the university's housing department. Barbara Robinson Shade's 1979 summary of Carson's career stated that despite his expertise, popularity, and warm heartedness, he had been frequently passed over for promotions in favor of less experienced white candidates. This story does have a slightly happy ending, but even that happiness is a little mired. On August 3rd of 1954, Carson Gawley signed papers to buy an undeveloped lot in the city's Crestwood neighborhood, a new area a few miles west of the university. Shortly thereafter, the board of the Crestwood Cooperative Housing Association received a petition signed by 31 of the association's 154 members, asking the board to meet and discuss buying back the lot to prevent the gullies from moving into the neighborhood. The board met on September 6, 1954, and the pro proposal was defeated in a vote of 64 to 30. Carson and Beatrice built their home, moved in, and found that though some neighbors still carried chips on their shoulders, even some of those who had voted to keep them out welcomed them. It hadn't been personal, they said. Instead, they merely feel, feared losing property value on their homes. Years later, a study would come out about housing discrimination in Madison. Though the gullies aren't named directly, the study stated that, quote, while some Negro families have been able to secure housing in white neighborhoods due to their social standing, the great majority do not. As a public historian, one who particularly likes storytelling through individuals, experiences like those of the gullies can seem unique or one-off. I wanna assure you that they are not. While the gullies may have been uniquely positioned to eventually acquire housing, their denials were shockingly, dishearteningly common. Nothing makes this more clear than a small film project from the early 1960s in Madison. Between September and November of 1961, a ragtag team of filmmakers, dubbing themselves as the Social Interference Committee, filmed 13 encounters across the city of Madison. The concept was brought forward by famed civil rights leader and then president of the Wisconsin NAACP, Lloyd Barbie. And the idea was very simple. Barbie and his team would use undercover filming techniques to document housing discrimination in Madison. And that's what they did. They captured in raw, shocking detail housing discrimination all across the city. I want to read some of the quotes from the footage. I'm sorry, but I can't let you have it. Not in this neighborhood. I don't want to have trouble with my neighbors. I'm sorry, but we don't feel that we can rent to colored people. No, why not? Myself, I don't care, but it's my neighbors. When you people come up, then property values go down. You know how it is. 
During a preliminary viewing of the film by university administrators, concerns were immediately raised that the use of undercover film footage had violated the privacy rights of individuals. There was no legal basis to this argument. In an effort to, quote, not compound this error, university administrators decreed that the film's undercover footage could never be released. Instead, they offered to film reenactments using actors. When Barbie and the other filmmaker Stuart Hanish refused, the university restricted the film. In April of 1962, a box of film reels made its way to the UW-Madison archive, accompanied by a letter that read, I send you here within 10 cases of film and magnetic tape. These are the hidden camera scenes of a film on housing discrimination in a medium-sized northern city. They are packed in a single sealed box. These materials are not to be used or released except on the specific authorization of university administration. Sealed and secreted in the UW archives, the contents of the film were not seen until 2018 when Kat Fan, the digital media archivist at UW, began to challenge the restriction. With the help of the Office of Legal Affairs, Fan was able to get the restriction lifted. Shortly thereafter, we partnered with PBS Wisconsin and the film was digitized and made available for the first time in almost 60 years. And I just have to plug that if you want to see the film in its entirety, it is playing in the exhibition Sifting and Reckoning every day. It's also available on our website, and it's an incredible object. Whether it's this blatant film footage or the experiences of the Gully family, both paint a clear picture of the types of social discrimination that was rampant in Madison in the mid-century. Housing discrimination that not only affected African-American families, but also Jewish families and those from other countries. But these forms of social discrimination were accompanied by legal and enforceable forms of discrimination sponsored by federal, state, and local governments. There are two important policies that worked in tandem all across the United States to restrict access to housing for non-white people. The first was a policy known as redlining. It can be hard to imagine now, but homeownership in the United States was not always as easily attainable. Prior to the federal government's interventions, there were unfavorable loan terms. Folks could be asked to put 50 to 70% of their home's values down in cash. There were no long-term fixed mortgages, meaning most mortgages were somewhere around five to seven years. In an effort to promote home buying and to increase investment opportunities for white, middle, and upper-class families following the Great Depression, the federal government intervened to provide stable, affordable, long-term mortgages. These mortgages provided by private banks were backed by the United States federal government. It was due to this backing that the government wanted assurances that these loans were going to be a sound investment or a good use of the federal government's money. In response, they created the Homeowners Loan Corporation, the HOLC, which was tasked with creating a neighborhood ranking system. The system of appraisal would later come to be called redlining. The corporation hired local people, generally people with a good working knowledge of the city and real estate, and these folks were then tasked with visiting neighborhoods, ranking them block by block based on a series of criteria. The rankings are as follows. An A rating or a green lining was the best. Always upper or middle class white neighborhoods that the HOLC defined as posing minimal risk for banks and other mortgage lenders as they were quote, ethnically homogenous and had room to be further developed. B was a blue rating and it was still desirable. So generally nearly or completely white US born neighborhoods that the HOC defined as still desirable and sound investments for mortgage lenders. <laughs> Yellow was C or declining areas where the residents were often working class and or first or second generation immigrants from Europe. These areas often lacked utilities and were characterized by an older building stock. And finally, there was red, redlining, D or hazardous. Areas here often received this grade because they were infiltrated with quote, undesirable populations, such as Jewish, Asian, Mexican, and black families. These areas were more likely to be close to industrial areas and to have older housing stock. To give you a sense of how this looked in Madison, which you can look up our redlining map, it's online at mappinginequality.com. The neighborhood where we are currently located was rated as declining due to the prevalence of rooming houses and apartments. It was described as, quote, an older section of the city on the decline. The Greenbush neighborhood just south of campus, which many of you will know as being eventually targeted for urban renewal, was given a hazardous rating. It was redlined. 
The description reads, quote, most troublesome area in the city, predominating foreign population of Madison. Many Sicilians live in this area and are reputed as meeting their obligations fairly satisfactorily. It added, the Italians resent being called Sicilians. Shorewood Hills, just west of campus, was given a green rating. The description reads, quote, the topography is excellent for a beautiful residential district near the University of Wisconsin. Good growth with a substantial community adjacent to Lake Mendota. Good schools, good transportation, all improvements, racial covenants near Black Hawk Country Club golf course. And I'll talk about racial covenants in a minute. These red line systems were not simply neighborhood descriptions, but delineators of loan ability. Red and yellow lined neighborhoods were ineligible for home loans, meaning that black, Jewish, and immigrant populations like Italians and Irish were unable to obtain federally backed mortgages. Without these mortgages, most families were literally unable to buy housing. Even if, let's say, a black family was wealthy enough to afford housing without a federally backed loan, they faced the problem of social discrimination, like the Gully family, or they faced racial covenants. This is the second policy that limited home ownership, and it's often called covenants or racial covenants. These covenants are built into property deeds, and they contain regulations generally on property use. Their prevalence rose out of a desire to make cities safer, so they often contain clauses that, for example, prohibit the keeping of farm animals in the city center to ward off filth and disease, or maintain that garages must be a certain distance from homes to prevent fires. The altruistic creation was quickly used to discriminate. In property deeds all across the United States, including here in Madison, there are covenants that state expressly that non-white people are not allowed to own or occupy that property. These covenants were not simply guidelines or suggestions, they were legally binding and enforceable. If a black person was found to have been living on that property or owning that property that had a racial covenant, they could have the property legally taken from them by the bank and lose all of their investment, every single dollar that they had paid. It was these two policies alongside social discrimination that deeply shaped our cities and continue to shape our cities. I know that there's probably one or two of you in the audience who may be history buffs and might be asking yourselves, what about the Fair Housing Act? With the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, redlining ceased as a practice and covenants became legally unenforceable, but the damage had already been done. While generations of white people have been able to buy homes and accrue wealth, black, Jewish, and immigrant populations were left behind. But it was not just these individuals' families and their wealth. It was the neighborhoods that were harmed as well. Without home ownership and without federally backed loans, red line neighborhoods fell into, quote, blight. They were unable to be updated and maintained and renovated without the support of affordable and accessible federal loans. And in the 1960s and 1970s, cities looking to take advantage of booming growth took advantage of these blighted areas and used redlining justifications to slate these neighborhoods for demolition during a period known as urban renewal. This is how the Greenbush neighborhood was lost. A redlined neighborhood fallen into disrepair due to chronic and targeted disinvestment was the first to be slated for destruction in favor of new apartments, homes, and buildings that would primarily be used by white upper-class Madisonians. It is not just the history of 60 years ago. As I said, housing discrimination is not really a history at all, as it continues deeply today. While it is not most visible in government loans, it is no less keenly felt by marginalized people seeking housing. Between 2004 and 2009, Wells Fargo intentionally steered Hispanic and Black homeowners into subprime mortgages and made them pay higher fees and rates than white borrowers. A 2018 study from the Brookings Institution found that homes in majority Black neighborhoods were appraised for 23% less than properties in mostly white neighborhoods, even when the homes were of similar quality and with similar amenities. The study estimated that homes in majority black neighborhoods are devalued by $48,000 per home on average, leading to a 156 billion, billion with a B, cumulative loss in value nationwide. Racial steering or blockbusting is the practice of steering non-white home seekers away from traditionally white neighborhoods. 
It is illegal under the Fair Housing Act, yet it still happens regularly. A Newsday study in 2016 revealed that 40% of real estate agents violate the Fair Housing Act, and racial steering is one of the most common violations. It is hard to understate just how much housing can affect a person's life. It is not just the material condition, the fundamental importance of having a roof over your head. And it is not just the loss of generational wealth for generations of marginalized people. Housing is the root, the bedrock of many of our society's inequalities. Where you live, down to the neighborhood, can affect whether you have access to healthy foods, whether you have access to health care. It affects the type of education you receive. It expects your it affects your exposure to green spaces or parks or on the reverse, toxic chemicals and pollution. Housing has, has been linked to rising inequalities across the board. We in Madison do not get a pass. Our city is often described as one of the most desirable places in the United States to live. The city is lauded for its restaurants and dining, its parks and lakes, its music and arts, its theaters. But it's desirable for who? In Dane County, the black arrest rate is 11 times higher than the white arrest rate and twice as high as the U.S. national average. Dane County has one of the largest educational achievement gaps in the state of Wisconsin with a nearly 50% point gap that divides black and white students in reading and math proficiency. A 2021 United Way Health Mobilization Plan found that Dane County has some of the worst health disparities by race in the nation from infant mortality, to food insecurity, to death rates, to mental health, to the COVID-19 pandemic. For health disparities, we rank consistently in the bottom percentile. As a public historian, I spend a lot of time thinking about the past, but more importantly, I think about the past and its links to the present. And what you begin to find is that most history is deeply tied to our present in visible and invisible ways. It is the thread that runs through our experiences, a line connecting us to those who came before us, but often it is a ghost that keeps haunting us. Sometimes it can feel easier to simply ignore the past, to keep our eyes firmly forward and never look in the rearview mirror. But as a public historian, I can also tell you that history is there whether you recognize it or not. The problem with ignoring the past beyond the colloquial threat of being doomed to repeat it is that our history doesn't really go away. It doesn't disappear from disregard or neglect. It waits in the wings, and it seems to assess for a moment when our current issues run headlong into the problems of our past. In other words, history is a ghost that rarely stays quiet for long. So whether it is housing discrimination or something else, I keep arguing that it is rarely just a history, not at all. In fact, housing discrimination is a raging crisis affecting our cities in real and measurable ways, leading to serious, consequ serious consequences now and for future generations. The question for us and for our elected officials and others in power is what we plan to do about it. Thank you. We do have about five minutes before the house opens if anybody has any questions. You said uh, covenants are not legally enforceable, but they still exist, yes? They do, and most people don't know because when you get your property deeds, it's kind of one of those pieces of paper that you just shove in a drawer and then you never have to look at again. And so most people don't read it too closely, but they are still in the property deeds. They're just unenforceable way to get rid of them? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so I, when I was in Minneapolis, I worked for a project called Mapping Prejudice, which mapped every single racial covenant in um, Hennepin County in Minneapolis. And they created a system in Minneapolis where you can remove your racial covenants, but it's unique to Minneapolis. So you'd have to create something like that here or in other cities. And one of the things that I liked about what they did with the program was that you have to pay $75 and then that money goes towards a fund that helps people who are without housing find housing. And so it's kind of doing that repair work because really it's symbolic, right? You're removing this clause, it's unenforceable, but it's only symbolic. And they wanted to make it something that was materially going to help people without housing. So it doesn't exist in Madison currently, but it could. How 
I realized I should repeat the questions. The question is, how did the covenant start? Um, so generally speaking, they started when new lots were being laid out. So there would be a new subdivision that was being built and the people who were selling that subdivision or who were selling homes in that subdivision, new builds, wanted to have something to sell them. And so you can see in the redlining that some of the green neighborhoods, it's a selling point that they have racial covenants. And so you'll also see housing ads that say that this neighborhood is restricted or this neighborhood has covenants on it. And that was kind of the symbol for white people who were buying housing, that you would be in an all white neighborhood. So it was generally speaking, the home developers or the neighborhood developers who were building and creating new neighborhoods. I'm curious, just uh, if in your research you came across uh, any evidence here of the, the presence of ghost buyers, which I know is a big thing in the Boston area. Our playwright of tonight's play actually wrote a second play about a couple working as ghost buyers. Yes, so this is the thing when you talk about housing discrimination, people often are like, well, the Fair Housing Act, like all these things. And there's all these mechanisms in home buying that allow for discrimination still and things that are harder to parse out or where people try and either A, perpetuate housing discrimination or B, work around housing discrimination that they know. So I haven't seen anything with ghost buying in Madison, um, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was happening <laughs> at all because um, it would be a mechanism. So. So I think at least what ghost buying to me means is you have somebody else who is representing as being the buyer of the house, even though they are not the ones who are going to be eventually buying it. And so this also works in appraising too. So if you've seen, there's been some really na big national news stories about a black family will have photos of themselves in their house and then the appraiser will come and they'll get a low value. They'll take down all the photos and have white family photos in the house and their values skyrocket like 30, 40, 50%. There's been multiple huge national news stories about this recently. It's similar for the buying. So sometimes what will happen is either way, like a black family will send a white family to look like they're buying the house so that they have a chance of buying it or the reverse. Yeah. Do you know what happens to the residents? Yes. Yeah, so when urban renewal happened, generally speaking in Greenbush and other places, um, including Minneapolis, which is where I know most about it, people sometimes were bought out of their houses and they were given what was like the city deemed as a fair market value, but they were often very undervalued because they said, well, it's a blighted neighborhood, so your house is worth nothing. Um, well, why is it blighted? <laughs> and who decided that it was? Um, and so oftentimes what happened is they were pushed out maybe with a little money, but there was no plan for where they would go. That was never a consideration. And so the people in Greenbush were dispersed throughout the city and often struggled to find housing wherever they were pushed because there was still so many forms of social discrimination going on um, and they were unable to buy housing. They were unable to get these loans. So they were dispersed throughout the city and quite frankly, the city didn't really care where they went. They just wanted them out. Hard means here the lights. Hi. Hi. I'm thinking ahead about all the building that's going to be done on, in South Madison on the Park Street area. And I'm wondering, as a uh, you know, member of this community, what do you think should we be looking for, advocating for, so that doesn't become a gentrified area? I mean, generally speaking, I think one of the lessons from history that I can speak to is what does the community want from these spaces and what does the community need? And so oftentimes what happens is the city comes in from the outside without consulting with the people in these neighborhoods and says, well, this is what you need. You need a, a high transit station. You need new affordable housing. You need a grocery store. Um, so we're gonna build you a Whole Foods, right? It's like, is that what we need in this neighborhood? Um, and oftentimes community don't get to be consulted on it. So the first thing I would say is consulting with the members of that community who will actually be there and use that theoretically so that people aren't being pushed out through methods like gentrification or new builds or in affordability. The other thing I would say is that with housing right now and with building new housing, particularly in cities like Madison or other booming cities, Minneapolis has a similar problem. We are like, there's such a small housing stock, we'll just build, 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 build. And 
we rely on trickle down housing that if we build enough housing and it's expensive that it'll trickle down that other less nice housing will be cheaper and then that'll be cheaper um, there's no data to show that trickle down housing works um, in fact you end up having these really nice apartments that sit empty for years that was a problem that happened in denver um, and so we need to think more creatively and intentionally about how we're getting people housing and how we're thinking about affordable housing in our cities, particularly in a city like Madison, where growth is I mean, just going to be a problem for us for the next five to 10 years. Okay, I'm getting this signal to wrap it up. Thank you all so much. I'm um, really excited. Thank you for having me and I hope you'll enjoy the play.